we had to bail out a number of banks. A lot of money was put in to clear non-performing loans. A lot of money was put in to recapitalize those banks. And the question we had to face was, for how long would the taxpayer continue bearing the burden for the irresponsibility of Nigerian banks? Now, there was a huge debate at that time. There were banks who said, we managed ourselves well. Why should we pay for the bad behavior of intercontinental and oceanic and so on? And our view in the central bank was, if we had not bailed out those banks, all of you would have gone under. Because the contagion risk would not have allowed the system to survive. Now, the central bank also accepted responsibility and committed to put in, I think, 50 billion naira every year. And we said we would recoup the cost of the banking sector recapitalization and reform from the entire banking industry. And it's about collective responsibility. We all have to start learning that when our colleagues misbehave, we need to call them to order. Otherwise, we are going to pay a price. Now, that was a unique thing. And I think, look, if you take it off the banks, you're going to have the taxpayers pay anyway. Somebody has to pay. Central bank is paying. The banks are paying. We share the costs of the crisis. Uh, you guys want to get it, get it off your books? Why don't you just get together, find out how much you owe the system, and pay one time and get it out of the way? So I would not advise the central bank to take it off, and I'm sure Sarah would not, and I'm sure MK Ahmed would not, uh, so, uh, and I'm sure the finance minister would not. So, um, it's one of the. So, let's get that out of the way. Uh, let me save. Um, now, I'm supposed to speak about regulation and compliance, uh, which is. I don't understand what this topic means, by the way, but I'm going to um, say a few things. But while we're on this, I think it's important to also talk about current conversations. And there's an ongoing conversation that seems to have started in the National Assembly about people trying to amend the Central Bank Act. Let me add my voice to those who have said there is nothing wrong with the Central Bank of Nigeria Act. There is nothing wrong with BOFIA. The CBN Act is one of the best central banking laws in the world. In fact, when we reviewed central bank laws, the only law that we saw that we would have learned a few things from was the law setting of the Bank Negara Malaysia. Now, if people who are supposed to implement a law do not implement it, the solution is not to change the law. And this reaction is a knee-jerk reaction. If you take away the independence of the central bank, if you bring it under political control, you hurt the system and long-term, you are institutionalizing the lack of autonomy. The reality is you have an independent, autonomous central bank whose independence was undermined by a combination of politicians and central bank actors, it is time to go back to what the central bank is supposed to be and implement the law. So I'll give you an example. People talk about ways and means. Ways and means only happened because all along the line, all the checks and balances collapsed. When the National Assembly talks about ways and means, the question is, where were the oversight committees of the National Assembly? When they, they did the law, 
they said very clearly that the central bank can only lend to the federal government if the federal government has no money of its own and that when you lend you lend up to five percent of previ previous year's revenue and once you reach that limit the power of the governor to lend money to the government is extinguished if you want to change it to from five percent to ten percent or fifteen percent you go and amend the law you don't ask the central bank governor to break the law but if the central bank has broken it you had a national assembly the reason you have the protection for the governor of the bank is exactly so he can say no we were all asked when we were governors to bring money and Sarah knows there was a day I was called by the finance minister and she wanted us to she, they needed a hundred billion and she called me and said she had spoken to Tunde Lemo and he said he would she, he should speak to me she should speak to me and I said why that he said you have reached your limit we have reached our limit he said so what do you want me to do break the law and at the end we just agreed that look we've done our interim audit we know how much we are going to pay you as dividend this year we can give you an interim dividend Sarah is there and we agreed to give them an interim dividend part of their surplus in advance okay the finance minister understood that this is the law the central bank governor is not supposed to break it and there was a reason for that law we had a conversation we found a solution that did not break the law there is absolutely nothing wrong with that act. The law, if the central bank had kept within that limit, we will not have inflation where we have it, we will not have exchange rates where we have it, we will not have these problems. And the reality is I have been talking about this since 2015. I first raised an alarm when ways and means was 4.7 trillion in December 2015. Civil society, where were they? the press I mean everything we're complaining about today is something that every economist would have told you would happen I know uh, I, as I was saying yesterday the president said we were pursuing unorthodox policies when he said it I laughed there was no, there's, those are not what you call unorthodox policies there are policies pursued by Idi I mean in Uganda by Mugabe in Zimbabwe by Chavez in Venezuela their, their policies we have seen them happen it's very easy once you print money you know where you're going to end up and by the way it's not just Nigeria the crisis you had in the US with Silicon Valley Bank is a result of too much money in the system 15 years the Federal Reserve has been pumping money into the system first counter cyclically after the crisis second after covid and what is the result silicon valley bank um, signature bank first republic bank between them those three banks had total assets of 522 billion dollars just this year and they failed and then after that you had Credit Suisse and when you think that the largest bank failure in US history old mutual was 320 billion and that was what triggered what triggered the world uh, the, the financial crisis of 2008 imagine what has happened in 2023 522 billion dollars three banks and that's why when we talk about regulation we've got to remember that banking as an industry is inherently risky and there are many reasons why it has to be regulated I was speaking yesterday at the financial markets dealers association and I said it's important to look at the difference between what happened in 2008 and what happened in 2023 with the banks and when you look at those two you also begin to understand the importance of regulation in 2008 the biggest problem was 
credit risk. The banks, again, had a lot of money, and then they went and started having all these uh, collateralized debt obligations, um, subprime mortgages, all sorts of toxic assets, and when the credit went bad, those banks went bottom up. It was credit risk. With Silicon Valley, it was the opposite problem. The Silicon Valley Bank had billions of dollars in treasury bills. The Federal Reserve has been pumping money. If you look at, well, let's start with the regulation. 2008, the United, United States passed a law, the Frank Dodd Act. We all know the Frank Dodd Act. Part of Frank Dodd required all banks with assets of $50 billion and above to subject themselves to a stress test by the Federal Reserve every year. What happened? After some time, you know, the thing with crisis, when it happens, we all panic. After some time, we forget. The Americans started saying there was too much regulation. Donald Trump, the Republicans, all banks were being constrained. There were too, many, too much capital requirements. These stress tests were too much of a problem. And the US Congress, against the advice of the Congressional Budget Office, amended the act. They actually passed a law called the Economic Growth Regulation Relief and Consumer Protection Act in 2018. Listen, a law called Regulatory Relief. That was Trump. And part of the, one of the conditions of that law was that the threshold for the stress test should be raised from 50 billion to 250 billion. The Congressional Budget Office said this increases the risk of banks with assets of 100 to 250 billion collapsing. They did not listen to them. And that was what happened to SVP. If Silicon Valley Bank had been under Frank Dodd and doing stress tests when they reach 50 billion, what happened would not have happened. How did SVP fail? Between 2020 and 2022, as a result of lose money, total assets of that bank increased from about 57 uh, billion dollars to over $200 billion in two years. From $70 billion to over $200 billion. They had nothing to do with the money. They couldn't build their credit portfolio. They went and purchased U.S. Treasury bills. Their bill holdings increased from $27 billion to $127 billion in one year. Silicon Valley Bank did not collapse because it had bad loans. Inflation hit America. Interest rates went up. The value of those liquid assets crashed. It had a liquidity event, sold off $21 billion in T-bills, and took a hit of $2 billion. 1.8 which is why we need to ask ourselves now in Nigeria, we've had eight years of easy money. Sorry, I think I need to read this off. You know, this is what I like about my new job. When I was governor of Central Bank, I didn't have all these people around me, so. <laughs> I know you bankers are all jealous, so for, and, and hopefully when you, when you finish, you'll end up being a traditional ruler and have this. You know, so in 2008, it was credit risk. But, I mean, you, you, you begin to think, what can be safer than U.S. Treasury bills? And yet, Silicon Valley 
collapsed because it had too much of U.S. treasuries. It was carrying huge interest rate risk. It was a market risk. Once the interest rates went up and the value of those assets went down, it had a short liquidity spurt and that was it. And that was the beginning of the run. And it led to the collapse of the other two banks. If this tells us anything, it is that when people begin to complain about too much regulation, they need to think what happened when regulation was rolled back in America. They need to think of Silicon Valley Bank, First Republic, Signature. Which is not to say that regulations cannot change. Regulations are dynamic and they keep changing. New risks emerge. And to be honest, you, bank directors, are the very first line in regulation. And what regulators need to do is focus more on making sure that banks are well managed and that banks understand the risks that they run. We keep telling bankers, you know, banking is a business like no other. It is the only business where people will come and carry their entire wealth and give you based on trust. You don't give them any collateral. Set up any kind of industry and you want to borrow a billion or two billion, you need collateral. The banks, you're borrowing money, trillions and trillions of naira without giving anybody collateral. The only thing that you have is that the central bank licensed you and the public trusts you. That is the only collateral that you have. It's your integrity, it is a trust. When a banking system begins to operate in a manner where the public does not trust it, that system will collapse. Trust is the foundation of banking. Which is why when the bank if there was any question about the integrity of an, it does, you don't have to steal money. Once your integrity is questioned, you are dismissed. And this is the reason, because the entire system collapses once trust, fail, once, once trust fails. If you lie to a customer, if you deceive a customer, if you have um, a problem with reconciliation and cover it up, you go. Not termination, not suspension, dismissal. Because bankers are supposed to be trustworthy. That's why people give you money. Now, regulations are one thing, of course. The actual doing of regulation is another thing. When I came to the central bank, I used to tell banking supervision that, you know, for years as a credit officer, I received bank, bank, bank examiners. But as a risk manager, as a chief risk officer, I don't think the regulators asked me the questions they were supposed to be asking me. Focus on looking at the loan book and seeing which ones are non-performing loans. By the time a loan is non-performing, it is too late. We need to focus more on how do you stop loans from going bad. We need to start asking banks, what are the risks that you run? How do you assess your macro risk? What is the board doing? How does, what, what kind of reports does the board get? You have your credit risks. Have you identified them? How do you choose your credit portfolio? How do you select your industries? Look at your product programs. What are the operational risks in those products? What are the market risks in those products? The quality of people who are running your risk management. The operational controls you have around your technology. By the time we focus more on what the board is doing, what the processes are, what the policies are, what the policies are, you then have the result. The result follows. But once we wait until banks book any kind of loans, operate in any kind of industry, and then at the end of the day, we just come and calculate this is 
substandard, this is doubtful, this is lost, it does not change the fact that the bank will fail. Therefore, the quality of risk management is something that we need to be focused on in our regulation. Set the guidelines and follow that. And that's why I agree with um, Mustafa on the suggestion of meetings with bank directors or chairmen uh, to, uh, to consult, yes, but to also ask them what they're doing to assess how much the board knows, how much governance the board is actually doing. And believe me, we have had cases where bank management controlled the board. When we went, and I've said this before, and it's public information, we had a bank where the bank CEO took a loan approval to the board. The board declined it, and she came down to her office and approved it that same day and disbursed. She overruled the board, and nothing happened. Because she had picked every board member and appointed the board member, and she owned the bank, or she believed she owned the bank. Is that still happening? I don't know. And these are the kinds of things we need to look at. And this is your role as board directors. Because that is the first line of defense before the central bank. So, personally, I think that um, we're at a time when we can look at the regulations, but all regulations that are aimed at strengthening risk management and governance should be given priority. And there should be a lot of delegation. We, we need to, and that conversation helps. Regular conversation with the board, regular conversation with the management. So I'll give an example. Today, we are going through difficult times. The central bank has to take decisions to walk back from eight years of lose money. Central bank has started tightening. Absolutely necessary because if the central bank is to focus on its role of providing stability, because that's what the central bank is supposed to do. We used to debate with Sarah and, and, uh, what ex the exact meaning of um, price stability conducive to growth. <laughs> you know? That, 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 that was the job of central bank. The central bank is not to create growth is to create an environment that is conducive to growth. It is not the finance ministry. It is not the one doing structural policies. Now, when the central bank returns to that role, now they've got to tighten money because for eight years, we've had situations where it's like driving behind a driver who trafficates left and then turns right. You have every MPC meeting and there's an announcement of an increase in NPR. And then the next day, ways and means is pumped into the system. So you say you're tightening money, but you are actually losing money. Now the central bank has started tightening. And we're seeing month and month inflation figures go down. Exchange rate needs to be stabilized. I'm happy CME is here. Um, I'm appealing to CME to please hurry and bring the $7 billion to the CBN, 10 billion, because that was promised at NESG. We are going to hold you, hold you to that. Because in the short term, we need to stop the hemorrhage. To stop that hemorrhage, we need liquidity in the market. And I keep saying, if you asked me before this started, if I were governor, what would I do to stabilize the currency? I would do exactly what the central bank is doing. Pay back the past dues, get liquidity into the market, and tighten money. That's all. But that's a short-term solution. And it will get us over the next year or two, and we can stabilize. And frankly, I think the Naira is where it should be, about 800. That's a really effective exchange rate. What we need to do is close the gap between the official and the BDC rates. However, after one or two years, the CME, we still have to pay back that money. And we have to address the fundamental question. Why is there no money coming in. Why is NMPC not able to bring in dollars? I'm sorry, this is the question that cost me my job. I will continue asking this question until NMPC is fixed or until I die. Where are the dollars? 
we need to shine light on NMPC. The finance minister cannot tell you because he doesn't have a metering system that reports to him. The finance minister cannot tell you that today this is how many barrels of oil that we produce and exported. You can only rely on NMPC telling him. Those barrels are revenue. They belong to finance. We've been talking about this for 10 years. We need a metering system. The finance ministry needs to know how much oil we are producing every day, how much oil we are selling and where the money is going. Because if you don't fix the leakages in that system, if you don't fix the revenue, the dollar revenue issue, you will never fix the exchange rate problem. Oil is not going to grow our GDP. I've always said that. Oil, I mean, if you, if you, if you, if you took out all the oil in Nigeria today and sold it, it would raise our per capita income to maybe $4,000. We won't even be a middle-income country. Oil will never make us rich, but it is working capital. It is working capital. It is a lubricant for our import-dependent economy. And we cannot afford to continue producing the oil and not seeing the revenue. We are no longer paying subsidies. So where are the dollars? Before it was under recovery. Now we don't have under recovery. Where is the money? Just the issue I raised for which I was suspended. You can suspend me again. Okay? But it is an issue that this country must address. NMPC is the most opaque oil company in the world. When I was in the Central Bank for 15 years, they had not been audited. So, you know, the Central Bank is easy to attack. But the central bank does not manufacture dollars. It's not an exporter. It produces Naira. It can buy dollars. It can create an environment for dollars to come in. It can bank dollars for, for government, but it does not produce dollars. And you want to have stability in the exchange rate? You've got to go back to those issues we raised in 2014. You need to follow the money. And I'm glad the CME is here. This is the number one priority. They follow the money from production to exports to return. Where is the money going? Now, there are things that are not NMPC's fault, or that could, but things that could have been done better. We're producing a lot of our crude oil um, offshore. Deep offshore production, uh, PSC agreements mean we get only 40% of that. It was 20% before. So if you produce a million barrels on deep offshore, you get only 400,000 barrels. We could increase the onshore production. But what have we done? The IOEs went out. And we'd signed all these SAAs with our cronies and our friends. We need to review. Those who are producing onshore oil, where we have the highest... These are wells that have been in production for seven decades. They are mature fields. At this time, you need international oil companies. Not Shell, not Exxon. You've got medium-sized IOCs operating in places like Gabon, in places like Latin America, in places like Asia, get them to come and maximize the output from those fields because that is where the government has the highest revenue stake. We can't just have Shell step out and then I take my friend Mustafa Chikyobi and co, who has never been in oil production, and then give him the license and say, come and produce oil and expect to get revenue. We need to, t to revoke those things and give people who can bring in the technology and the skills to sweat those, because you need to have a long-term solution to this problem. Plus other structural changes, moving to alternative energy. CNG vehicles would save you 60% on PMS. 
convert 3 million vehicles and see what happens to inflation, see what happens to um, your, 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 foreign, your foreign reserves. So I get worried because while the central bank certainly has done a lot of things wrong in the last eight years, there has been so much attention on the CBN and we, ha we are not looking at other people who may have even done worse. We paid 11 trillion naira in fuel subsidy. There's no accountability up to now. The National Assembly called NMPC to bring the documents. They refused. And by the way, let me advise. Let me advise that this idea of the president being petroleum minister is not a good idea. We, the last president was minister of petroleum for eight years. When I was governor of Central Bank, we had a petroleum minister. So when I talked about NMPC, I could attack Dizani. Now nobody can talk about petroleum because eight years, if you talk, you're attacking the president. We need that buffer. Somebody has to be there. So a minister has to be there who is held accountable by Nigerians. I say this because if we're talking about banking, if we're talking about the banking system, if we talk about the economy, we've got to look at all these linkages. And this excess focus on banks, on regulation, and all that, it's important, but we also have to look at transparency and regulation in other areas. Okay, so what are the risks that you run today? as a central bank titans money, please look at your portfolios. My fear is that if a bank is going to go down at this time, it will not be credit risk, but it could be market risk. And we need to have a stress test on the banking industry. And this is where the directors come in. We need to have stress tests and a conversation between the central bank and the directors. And the purpose of these tests is not to punish anybody or investigate anybody. It is to understand which banks are at risk and what steps need to be taken to protect them in the event of a shock. If you've had years of lose money, I know up to a few weeks ago, I don't know those of you in the market, Treasury bill rates were 3%, right? Bond rates were very low. How much of those low-yielding assets are banks holding? And what is the value of those assets now that interest rates have gone up? And if you need to sell them off, if you have a liquidity event, how much loss would you take? And do you have enough capital? The banks that are net positive in dollars have been reporting billions and billions of profit. The markets are happy. Well, how about the banks that are net takers of dollars? Do they have the capital to absorb the losses from the huge devaluation? And I'm happy that the central bank has come out to advise or maybe direct that these, ex these extra billions you're getting from revaluation of your dollar holdings, don't rush into paying them off as dividends. I know the capital market is probably not happy. They were, they were, they were, busy, they were, they were salivating. You know? But... That was exactly the right thing to do. I was very happy to see that circular. It's exactly the right thing to do. If you pay that off now as dividend, what happens if you have a revaluation? Do you claw it back? Because these are unrealized gains. So these are the kinds of proactive things we need to do. But I think... Um, the way the Bankers Committee operates, or it, that is the way it operated, with the strategy meetings annually, with the regular conversation, regulations are formed in consultation anyway. 
Because frankly, all the regulations that came out, at least in my time, came out as a result of th those meetings, those conversations. And to the best of my understanding, every time the central bank issues a regulation, it sends out an exposure draft. And you all have a chance to speak to it, to respond. So what I would like us to do is, let's ne let's, let us never get to a mindset where we think regulation is a problem. It is not. You know, we are in an industry, the nature of banking is that you only make money through maturity transformation. That is the, that is the basis for your profits. And if today, there is no bank in the world that will survive, if everybody who has money in the bank and who can take it today, if they say they want their money today, that bank goes under. No bank in the world will survive. And that's why you are on a constant precipice. You know, somebody, you've got to constantly monitor that risk. And once one big bank gets it, today you hear First Bank or GT or Fidelity, once it gets hit, the contagion happens. The final point I would like to make on regulation, uh, there is this ongoing conversation as to whether the central bank should continue to be the regulator of the banks and the supervisor or should just focus on um, monetary policy and whether it should create an FSA kind of thing. Look, even the British who created FSA discovered later that it was not working where the banking system is concerned. There's one reason why the central bank has to continue to supervise banks. The central bank is the lender of last resort. If the central bank is going to fund the bank and bail out the bank, the central bank has to supervise the bank. You want to create an FSA and put pensions and insurance and other regulators, that's fine. But so long as the central bank is the lender of last resort to banks, if I were the governor of the central bank, I would fight tooth and nail to keep banking supervision and regulation in the CBN. Unless you are going to find funding for the banks if they go under from somewhere else. So these are conversations I think that we need to have. And I think as bank directors, you need to join this conversation. I'm happy the CME is here. Uh, the CME understands that it is in the best interest of the economy to have an independent, autonomous central bank, okay, running monetary policy, complying with the law. There is no tension. You know, sometimes you have productive tension, but there is no conflict at all. There is no competition between finance and, and central bank. But politicians should not be allowed to have a new jerk reaction. The National Assembly should explain to us what it was doing for eight years with these ways and means before it starts amending the CBN Act. So if there's one thing I leave you with, or if there are a few things I leave you with today, is that one, the solution to your issues is not light regulation but it's regulation that focuses on getting you to do the right thing. You as directors are the first line regulators. Actually, if the central bank comes and finds things wrong with the bank, it's an indictment of the board. Before the central bank examiner comes, the board should have taken it. So, I mean, small things. Who does your chief risk officer report to? What is your board audit committee doing? Because your chief internal auditor is supposed to report to the board audit committee. Long before the central bank comes, you people should be able to get the issues. And the way the CBN operates is if you as chairman go to the central bank and say, CBN, we have a problem. This is what we have discovered. The central bank would work with you to fix the problem. If you cover it up and the central bank finds it, then you are part of the problem, not the solution. And this is, I think, where directors need to have that mindset.
you need to see yourselves more as representatives of the regulator. I know you're representing shareholders, but remember that your shareholders own only 10% of the money you are trading with. Your capital equity ratios are 10%, 12%, 14%. .10%. Where is the rest of the money coming from? They're coming from depositors. While you are protecting your shareholders, you must remember that the central bank is protecting those depositors. And you must protect the depositors first and then make as much profit as you can while keeping that money safe. Once the central bank understands that the board has this mindset, you don't have a problem. You don't. My understanding of central, if they, if they understand they've got good risk management, good audit, a good board, when they come, they will take your word for it. So this is the nature, it's a two-way process. And I think I'd, I, I want to leave that with us. I think we should not allow a tampering minister, please, I want you to please help us support that sh they should not tamper with the CBN Act and Bofia. Instead, we should just ask what went wrong and how do we make sure we do not go back to that. Central banks should continue to supervise and regulate banks. And hopefully, um, if we do the stress tests, we'll find that there's nothing wrong. And if we find that there's a risk, we'll take the steps needed to make sure we do not have an SVB situation on our heads. And still the seven to $10 billion for stabilizing the market from Minister Wale Edu. Uh, we're waiting for that, uh, for that check and an MPC uh, to begin to bring money into the market. So these are my, I don't know if this is what you wanted or what you got, but you know, I, I can't be restricted into, into something. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you very much.